all these things working together might mean that we never have to pay out because we've prevented the catastrophic attack. But even if we do have a catastrophic attack, anything that is going to cause trillions of dollars of damage and takes down an entire industry, the government is going to have to step in and rescue it anyway. I'm Stephanie Pell, Senior Editor at Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, January 11th, 2023. Various press reports have indicated that the Biden administration intends to release its cyber strategy in the coming weeks. The cyber strategy will likely cover a range of issues. One potential topic could involve the creation of a federal response or backstop to the financial exposure risks that insurers and reinsurers face from future catastrophic cyber incidents affecting those that they insure. To talk about the pros and cons of a federal backstop for the cyber insurance ecosystem, I sat down with Brian Cunningham, Executive Director of the Cybersecurity Research and Policy Institute at the University of California, Irvine, who co-authored the article, Uncle Sam Re, Improving Cyber Hygiene and Increasing Confidence in the Cyber Insurance Ecosystem Via Government Backstopping. We talked about what is keeping cyber insurance executives up at night, why the cyber insurance industry has not incentivized better cyber hygiene by the insured, and how a federally funded backstop could assist in shoring up the cyber insurance ecosystem. It's the Lawfare Podcast, January 11th. Brian Cunningham on a federally funded backstop for the cyber insurance ecosystem. Brian, you and your co-author Shaheen Talesh wrote an article where you argue that there is a need for a federally funded financial backstop for the cyber insurance ecosystem. Before we tackle that argument, can you define what you mean by the cyber insurance ecosystem? What is it and who are the players? Well, first, Stephanie, thanks very much for having me. As I used to say in radio, I'm a a frequent listener and first-time caller to the Lawfare podcast. So all ecosystems are complex, right? And like most, the cyber insurance world has many players who don't always share the same motivation and don't always act in concert. In fact, most of the time they don't act in concert. So for purposes of our paper and across the 60 interviews that we did, we defined the cyber insurance ecosystem to basically be all the key participants in seeking, selling, buying, or managing cyber insurance. So this included actuaries, data brokers, cybersecurity and insurance lawyers, forensics experts, insurance uh, brokers, insurance technology companies, risk managers, underwriters, and technology experts and engineers. That was our ecosystem. You begin your article with a hypothetical cyber attack. Uh, Can you talk about that hypothetical and more broadly, why you wrote this article? Uh, Why was this article needed at this point in time? And and what did you hope to accomplish in writing the article? Well, Stephanie, as we say in the paper, it all started with the water heaters. We have our hypothetical attack based on some real work that sort of white hat hackers did in determining that there were flaws in home devices, specifically water heaters and air conditioners, that could be exploited to create sort of a cascading damaging effect on an energy grid. So we created that hypothetical attack coupled with some other attacks that in our fictional scenario took down one of the regional nodes of a very, very large internet service provider and basically put everyone and everything in a large region of the United States in a blackout. And the genesis of the project was that my institute at UC Irvine, the Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute, got a very generous grant from a family foundation. And we did a sort of interconnected series of research projects around the general theme of securing the seams of the internet of everything. So the idea was for our research activities, what would be the biggest bang for the buck? How could we have the most impact for the amount of research we were able to do? So one of the three we settled on trying to find areas, what we called seams, where we could have an effect across a lot of cybersecurity important issues was the cyber insurance industry, because there had been this expectation 
earlier in the last decade that the cyber insurance companies would be very well placed to successfully incentivize better cyber practices, better cyber hygiene, as we call it, by their insureds. And this was a way that possibly you could incentivize and maybe require good cyber practices without very intrusive government regulation. So we started doing this research. We interviewed 60 plus people, uh, as I said, across the cyber ecosystem. We got access to a very large database of cyber insurance data for a year, and we reviewed pretty much all the cyber insurance policies we could get our hands on. And when we wrote the paper, one main goal I had, like you, Stephanie, I think I'm a, I am came late to academia in life. And <clears throat> so one goal I had was to make the paper very readable and possibly even interesting uh, to readers outside the academy and especially to policymakers and journalists. So this is why we start the paper with a hypothetical sort of screenplay-like scenario that, again, starts with the water heaters and winds up taking down a very large internet service provider node. And there's a whole appendix to the paper where the skeptics who say, oh, these guys just made all this stuff up can go and see that actually everything we hypothesize is based on real research and real events. We just sort of put it all together in in a very catastrophic way. And I will say that one of the things that does distinguish your article is the the use of real world scenarios and you all at the end actually present a, a draft statute um which is a formal congressional staffer i was yeah. very <laughs> pleased to see and i and yeah. i know is not it's not always easy to write statutory language but you you've also perhaps distinguished your your article from other scholars who have certainly you know written on the potential effects and economies of catastrophic events across the cyber insurance ecosystem. Y- you mentioned it, but you interviewed a whole lot of key players and stakeholders. Can you talk a little bit more about that interview process? Sure. It was very non-directed. You know, we we had, I don't know, five or six large topics that we had in an outline, and we didn't really give the interviewees too much notice about what we were going to talk to them about. Now, of course, being an academic project, we guaranteed everyone anonymity and we don't quote anyone by name in the paper. And we actually found, this is back in, started in 2018, so 2018, 2019, uh, people very willing to talk about it and not just kind of the usual suspects, lawyers and business people who have an incentive to tell us that their company's product will solve this whole problem. We talked to all kinds of people, including uh, importantly, the risk managers and companies who actually have to go out and buy this stuff. And we, across the board, found that everyone believed, again, this was 2018, 2019, everyone believed that the cyber insurance process or ecosystem had very good potential for incentivizing better cyber behavior among millions of people, but really had not lived up to it. That was finding one. Finding number two was that there was this dawning realization, which became even more acute during COVID-19 pandemic, that you really could have a trillion dollar plus event or series of events that could financially threaten the entire cyber insurance market. And I think that has only been proven to be true in the years since we did the research that this thankfully hasn't happened yet, but has become much more widely accepted that it very well may happen. And so I think people were already suspecting a lot of what has happened in the two or three years since we did our research. So that's, that's pretty scary, but also gratifying as a researcher. So it sounds like the threat of this kind of a a catastrophic or, or incredibly costly trillion dollar event was keeping a lot of the folks that you were talking about up at night. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, even before we really got into the throes of COVID, as a result of the Petya and not Petya attacks, and then uh, slightly later, solar winds, which kind of happened on the cusp of when we were publishing the paper, so it's not extremely well covered in the paper, uh, they started to really understand that you could have this event or interconnected set of events that could threaten the viability of the financial status of 
all cyber insurance funds worldwide, or even all cyber insurance funds and reinsurance of a single company or series of companies. And of course, that's the ball game, right? I mean, the whole point of insurance is to is to pool and manage risk. And if you have too much of it happening at the same time in one sector, that can take down the industry almost like it did after 9-11 with real estate insurance and construction insurance. And I definitely want to get to not Petya and, and solar winds, but I want to focus on some of the factors that enable the kind of catastrophe and concern that you've described among industry players. Well, I think, again, when we were doing our research three or four years ago, the number of interconnected devices, IoT devices, Internet of Things devices on the internet was already getting very, very large and predictions were that it was going to even get much larger. And so the potential for attackers to take over these devices, make them into zombies is the, <laughs> the, the scientific phrase for it, and use them to launch denial of service attacks, massive ransomware attacks, other types of attacks was sort of exponentially larger than it had been five years before. And just by the numbers was going to increase astronomically between when we were doing our interviews in, let's say, 2025, 2030. In addition to the fact that, you know, ransomware as a service and malware as a service was starting to become very available so that somebody who really had almost no technical knowledge could just go on the internet if they knew where to look and find ransomware or other types of malware that they could use to launch attacks. And by the way, now, as you've seen in 2023, folks are using chat GPT to generate the scripts for malware attacks. So it's even worse than it was then. And then finally was the realization that nation state actors and their proxies, meaning you know Russian Federation and Russian citizens who in many cases can be hackers for money during the day and then hackers for the state at night were sort of unbound in their willingness to risk damage to the entire world just to achieve an objective, either a financial or foreign policy objective. So all these things sort of came together and people said, wow, this could really be a massive problem. And then since we did our research, COVID-19 hit and insurance companies realize that you could easily have a global event that could risk the viability of the system. So you touched a little bit on this before, but what is the likely response that that you predicted by the cyber insurance ecosystem to the kind of catastrophic attack that we've been talking about? Well, the, the most immediate response, and apologies to our listeners for getting a little wonky now, has been, particularly in the wake of some of these massive attacks, to start to try to enforce initially in coverage denial and then litigation something called a war exclusion. And if you've ever read any of your insurance policies carefully, which as lawyers, hopefully we have, they all include these. They'll say sometimes force majeure, acts of God. They'll sometimes specifically say uh, war or terrorism attack. And for our purposes, the acts of God and force majeure are as important, but the policies will say, and not just cyber policies, all kinds of policies, that if the damage that you're trying to get insurance to pay for was caused by an act of war, then they don't cover it. Well, the problem in cyberspace is almost every significant, large, or catastrophic attack is going to have some element that could be described as a nation state actor, a country. And in many cases, there's an argument that it was part of a war. And so what the insurance companies started doing, again, after the Petya and not Petya attacks, is they started to say, particularly Lloyd's with regard to Merck, but there were others, to say, hey, we believe the Russian government was behind this we believe it was part of a war against Ukraine. <laughs> uh, back in those days, it was a much, um, still painful for the Ukrainians, but a, a more of a non-kinetic type of war. And therefore, we're not going to cover you. Well, this obviously is a huge 
in and of itself ecosystem threatening event for the insurance industry, because if you could get a judge or a series of judges to buy that theory that any time you can assert that a nation state involved in an armed conflict was responsible for an attack, you don't get coverage. First of all, it's going to create endless litigation, almost impossible to prove attribution in court, particularly without the government being involved with classified information. And if the insurance companies can win, it would almost destroy the coverage because, as I said, so many of these large attacks probably have some sort of nation state involvement, whether or not it's actually part of a war. But for an insurance company to actually win, you and your co-author in your paper really go through some difficult hurdles to get there. Can you talk a little bit about that legal analysis? Well, yeah. So first thing to say about that is it it's based on very thin precedent, right? There, there's been a few terrorism-related cases over the last half century and the analysis kind of relies on those. It's, it's, it's a lot like, Stephanie, what, what you and I and our colleagues in government faced after 9-11, where a lot of the legal precedents are, first of all, very old, and secondly, not really easily translatable into the 21st century. But essentially, what the courts have said is that you would have to, if you want to deny coverage based on a war exclusion, and these are not cyber cases, by the way, these are kinetic terrorism cases for the most part including the Pan Am uh, shoot down or bombing, you'd have to show a number of things. One, that an actual nation state was responsible. Two, that the event that you want to be excluding coverage for was part of an actual armed conflict. So they very specifically talk about the fact that terrorism itself and sort of smaller civil war type conflicts within countries would not count. And there's a number of other things that you have to prove, all of which are one, very, very hard to prove with publicly available evidence, and two, very hard to prove at all, right? Because you have to show the intent of the country that you're alleging committed the attack was to further some war aims. And when you're talking about cyberspace where the battlefield is global and the enemies are sort of endless, it's very, very difficult to do that. So it's not so much, our concern isn't so much that insurance companies will routinely win these cases, but the very fact that they're willing now to litigate them and spend the money to do that is if any judges start saying that these are viable claims is going to throw the whole economics of the decision-making of risk managers in doubt. Because if you can, you know, if you pay for the right sort of coverage, if you do what's required of you under the policy, if you get hit with an attack, and then just because they can claim a nation state was involved, the insurance company can die you coverage, you pretty rapidly start to say, as many of the lawyers we talked to did say, why bother paying for the coverage? Now, I want to ask you, about you know the the belief i guess hope that notwithstanding all of this the cyber <laughs> insurance industry would actually have the effect of reshaping cybersecurity among other things it would incentivize better cyber hygiene by the insured you and your co-author it's very very you know, forcefully talk about that, that that mm -hmm. just didn't happen and isn't happening. Why do you think that that's the case? Well, if you look up the papers that Shaheen Talesh and I wrote, and I obviously encourage people to do that, um, you'll find there's actually two papers. So the paper that we're talking about in this podcast is sort of our prescriptive paper. It's our what to do about it paper. And we tried very hard to make it very actionable, which is why it's in the form of a statute, even though most people's eyes will glaze over when they try to, to read the thing. And as, as a former staffer, you'll appreciate that. First of all, the first paper sort of diagnoses the problem. Why, despite a lot of early hope, uh, what were insurance companies not actually affecting people's behavior very much in a positive way? And there's a whole sort of raft of reasons for that, including that a lot of the new technology that a lot of people hoped would enable insurance companies to better monitor, better assess risk, better do pricing, and better compel their insureds to do things just wasn't being used for that. It was being used for 
as I guess you would expect in a capitalist society, it was being the technology was being used much more for figuring out how they could sell more insurance at a at a at a better price uh, for them. And so once we once we sort of concluded that in the first paper, then we started to say, okay, what can you do about it? And that's where the second paper comes in. And in that second paper, I think you do a really nice job of defining a complex problem. And I'm going to read a a quote from your paper. You say that we find that the risk of a catastrophic cyber attack to the solvency of the global insurance ecosystem is real and that cyber insurers have not as yet fulfilled their promise to meaningfully improve our collective cyber hygiene. So in response to that problem, you and your co-author, as we've mentioned, propose a legislative solution. And, And one of the key parts to that solution is a proposed government backstop for the cyber insurance ecosystem. And and before we get there, though, I, I want to ask you, why do you think a new law is needed at this point in time? Well, Stephanie, there's a, a quip sometimes attributed to John Adams in which he said, one useless person is a shame, two useless people are a law firm, and three or more useless people are a Congress. And um, <laughs> it turns out, <laughs> which I found completely amusing, and you will too, given your entertainment background, that that quote actually doesn't come from the real John Adams. It comes from the writers of the musical 1776 who put it in the mouth of the character of John Adams. <laughs> but you'd be amazed how many people think John Adams actually said that. In any event, it has a certain amount of merit, right? Have both of us having worked in the legislative branch. So essentially what we concluded was that a very heavy-handed government regulation, such as just a law that says everyone who is on the internet has to do the following 20 things, just would not work. First of all, Congress is not really well set up to regulate problems that are constantly changing in terms of the solution. So you really wouldn't want to pass a law that said everyone has to have multi-factor authentication, even though multi, multi-factor authentication in 2023 is one of the very best tools we have. It's highly likely in 2027, 2028, there'll be different tools that'll be better. So we didn't think a straight up legislative solution where the government just proscribes a bunch of things would be a good way to go, not to mention the fact that you'd probably never get Congress to pass such a thing. So instead, we we were inspired by the uh, Terrorism Insurance Act from shortly after 9-11, which I alluded to before, which was a um, the TRIA, it's called, uh, was a very, uh, very ambitious government program that was intended to solve the problem that occurred right after 9-11-2001, in which you just couldn't get insurance for new construction because the payouts for the World Trade Center attacks were believed to be so large that it wouldn't make economic sense for insurance companies to insure construction. And so essentially the whole industry was frozen for a time. And so Congress passed this law that set up a a government backstop, a financial system that if there were another terrorism attack that was sufficiently large that the Secretary of the Treasury found it to be uh, catastrophic, that's not the word they use, but significant enough, that insurance companies could essentially be bailed out by the U.S. Treasury. And part of the reason we thought that was a good starting point is that that law had a sunset clause in it. So it has to be reauthorized by Congress every couple of years. And by the time we were doing our research and writing our paper, it had already been reauthorized multiple times by multiple different Congresses of both political parties. So we felt like that was a pretty stable legislative solution to build on. And then we also were able to build on the findings and recommendations. And I have to give a big shout out to the Cyber Solarium Commission, which uh, did pretty comprehensive work right around the time we were doing our research and came up with a bunch of recommendations. And so what we do is we create what we call the Catastrophic Cyber Attack Insurance Program, which is you know named based on the terrorism one. And it does what the TRIA did for terrorism insurance, which is it creates a large government financial backstop. So if there's a catastrophic cyber attack, and if it's certified as such by the Secretary of the Treasury based on advice from the National Cyber Director and the Cyber uh, 
uh, and CISA and, uh, and the intelligence community could say, hey, this is a catastrophic attack. So now we're going to essentially step in and take the financial liability that would otherwise bankrupt these insurance companies. But then what we did, which the TRIA does not do, is we said, okay, cyber insurance companies, if you want to have access to this fund in the event that you're about to go bankrupt after a catastrophic cyber attack, you must do certain things and you must put certain requirements on the people that you insured. And we can talk about what those requirements are. But the idea was that without heavy-handed government regulation, the insurance industry, which was kind of like just a massive delivery system, right? Because there's few other parts of the economy that can put requirements on as many businesses and as many people as the cyber insurance industry can so that you essentially get a twofer. You stabilize the cyber insurance business and you then incentivize these kind of cyber hygiene measures that are still uh, sadly lacking in most most of us. So as you noted, you do set forth a number of different requirements, which I, I invite you to talk about, but specifically with the eye towards do they address some of what your critics might say? It is not, you know, an uncontroversial proposal right. you're making. So, so how does your proposal address like, your critics' best arguments? Well, one of the things other scholars in this space say is, why don't we just literally either replicate the TRIA, the terrorism law, or just sort of slide cyber attacks into the coverage of that law. And that's actually been tried. The Treasury Department a few years ago sort of tried to amend uh, the regulations to include cyber attacks. But the problem is that under the terms of the TRIA, the Terrorism Insurance Program, it cannot be a state actor that commits the the act. So that almost immediately makes it not, not functional for our purposes. The other thing that critics will say, of course, is, well, we, we don't like government involved in anything. And why should the taxpayer ultimately be on the hook for bad behavior by insurance companies or negligence by individuals or companies? And our answer to that, and we, we in the paper, we, we, we basically parse out all the arguments that we could find against what we're saying, and we provide responses to them. But our, our counter argument to that is, well, first of all, Part of the reason why the terrorism program is considered to be so successful is it's literally never had to pay out, partly because a lot of the measures that were put into place after 9-11 have successfully prevented a, another catastrophic terrorism attack, thank God, on the, on the U.S. And so our point is it's possible that by incentivizing things like better cyber incident reporting, mandatory but legally pr protected information sharing acceptance in claims management and litigation of the attribution that the government announces. So the government says that, yep, North Korea did it. Uh, it was part of a, a armed conflict or it wasn't. So they don't litigate that and then not enforcing these war exclusions and requiring things like multi-factor authentication and, and regular outside third-party cybersecurity assessments. And now in 2023, I would say also incorporating technologies to combat quantum decryption threat in the future. So all these things working together might mean that we never have to pay out because we've prevented the catastrophic attack. But even if we do have a catastrophic attack, anything that is going to cause trillions of dollars of damage and takes down an entire industry, the government is going to have to step in and rescue it anyway. And so you're much better off planning for this in advance and having to kind of figure it out after the attack like we did under after 9-11. And I you know, I think us and our colleagues who were in government at the time did a pretty good job of responding to that. But, you know, there were a few excesses that were involved in some of the post 9-11 legislation and activities. And I just think it's better to take the best practices, the best recommendations of things like the Cyber Solarium Commission and build them into a law in advance so that you don't have to figure it all out after the catastrophic attack. And as I understand what you're saying... Your proposal also may have an effect of, of keeping, I mean, nothing's foolproof, but, but putting us in a better position to prevent such attacks with things like information sharing and better incentivizing cyber hygiene among those who were insured. 
which we haven't done a good job of doing right now. Right. And to, just to be clear, the, the cyber hygiene measures I mentioned, multi-factor authentication and the like, you will not find those in our proposed law. And the reason is, as I said earlier, it's extremely difficult for a Congress in a law or even really the Treasury Department in regulation to keep up with the changes in the threat vectors and the protective technologies and the best practices. So instead, what we do is we delegate to key U.S. government officials, the director of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure, Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, the National Cyber Director, Secretary of the Treasury, to make and update those requirements on a regular basis. And also the insurance companies have the ability to do that themselves. And part of why we think that's valuable is there's the growth, which is covered more in our first paper, but there's the growth now of all these insure tech companies and technologies. So, you know, every 20 and 30 year old uh, wants to disrupt something, right? So there's a bunch of companies that are disrupting the insurance business. Think of what progressive insurance does where they offer you the ability to allow them to track your driving habits and therefore you might get discounts or, or penalties if you based on the way you drive. So there are technologies that could be deployed in the networks of insureds by their insurance companies that would sort of in a real-time basis track the threats and the financial incentive for the companies to do that is that then the insurers could dial up and down the cost of insurance based on how well you're doing. Now, as a former general counsel, of course, I don't love that idea because I don't love the fact that and a third party insurance provider is getting a bunch of my data in real time. But there's all kinds of examples where that's actually done in other insurance areas like auto insurance. So I think it's possible, but that's just one example. The point is that the government probably isn't nimble enough to provide in law for these cyber hygiene measures, but the insurance companies are close enough to their customers and probably are nimble enough and have the financial incentive to do that. So has anything happened since you published these articles that suggest there is momentum for a federally funded cyber insurance backstop? A lot, actually. And uh, as I mentioned, I, I, I a little bit like you're some, somewhat of a newcomer to academia. I spent most of my career more out on the, you know, what I would say in the real world, doing things and dealing with problems instead of writing about them. So it's just exceedingly gratifying that not just based only on our paper, but you know, lots of people come up with the same idea at the same time and, and events drive these things. But the, in the United States, for example, the Department of the Treasury and the National Cyber Director have actually issued in the last three or four months a uh, request for comment in the Federal Register on something very close to our exact proposal. And the initial request included a, a number of questions which really – now, I hate to blow our own horn, but they're, they're specifically answered in our paper. And so we've provided publicly available comments to that request for information. We've been in contact with some of these agencies. And there's, I think, real momentum to do something in this area. Now, as we say in the paper, we really intended our draft Catastrophic Cyber Attack Resilience Act to just be a starting point for debate. We realized that the numbers probably aren't the right numbers. We, we set the threshold of 50 billion. The, some of the measures are controversial, as you said. But now the government, uh, meaning both the, the Biden administration and the Congress, is now uh, sort of paying attention to this. And I think you're going to see real momentum. And by the way, same thing in the United Kingdom. I've been contacted by folks there who are considering a solution like this too. So I think, again, not in any way, shape, or form solely because of our work, but consistent with our work, a lot of these things are moving. What doesn't appear to be moving as fast as we would have wanted is the companies themselves sort of self-regulating. Because a lot of times what happens, as you know, is under the threat of new laws or new regulations, the private sector will try to sort of ward those off or reduce the, the, the burdensomeness of them by doing their own thing. And that really hasn't happened as far as we can tell. Now, we didn't go back and redo all of our 60 interviews, but we track it pretty closely. And I think at this point, everyone is sort of waiting to see what the government is going to do. And also, as predicted in the paper, there have been now multiple 
sets of litigation based on the concept that insurance companies shouldn't have to cover uh, cyber attacks that were assertedly part of an armed conflict. And most recently, the two big cases in the United States, one against Merck and one against a group called Mondelez, which I think, among other things, owns Nestle Candies, uh, were settled. (laughs) And the settlements are sealed. So I think part of what that tells you is that both sides, both the insurance companies and the insureds, really don't want a public judicial resolution of this question right now because of what we flagged in the paper that either way, if you get a definitive ruling, it's going to upend the industry. But certainly if judges start to say, yeah, you can exclude these claims, that just throws the whole business into chaos. So I, I hope that the government, meaning Congress and the president, get ahead of the courts. Because again, I think it's better to establish this scheme, this establish this legislative framework before you get a bad decision, because it's just more well thought out than if you have to react to either an attack or a bad decision. That's my opinion anyway. So on that theme of getting ahead of things, there have been a number of news reports that the Biden administration is going to be releasing its cyber strategy, possibly by the end of this month. Do you think that in some way or another, that cyber strategy might discuss a plan to create a federally funded cyber insurance backstop? It's a good question. I don't know the answer. I was, as we're recording this on January 9th, recently at the Consumer Electronics Show. And interestingly enough, a lot of the senior government officials who were there were asked about the strategy uh, and when it was going to come out, which we didn't get a definitive answer to, and what's in it. And a lot of the focus, especially by uh, Jen Easterly, the head of CISA, but also by uh, Deputy National Cyber Director, was around putting the economic risk of cyber attack on parties that could best absorb it, not on individual companies and businesses. And boy, that sure sounds like this proposal to create a catastrophic cyber attack resilience statute and to make the insurance companies in some ways aggregators of this risk and this problem fits squarely in the center of that strategy. So, you know, you've been involved in in, in these creating strategies. I was involved in the first national strategy to secure cyberspace back in 2003. There's a lot of what I call in the paper, what to leave in, what to leave out, footnote, uh, props to Bob Seeger for that lyric, you know, which parts of government should do which things. So I, I, don't, I don't rule out the possibility that even if the administration believes that such a law is a good thing, because they've got this process underway with Treasury, with the National Cyber Director, with public comment, they leave it out of the strategy. Also, one government official did say that they were hoping that this strategy would be at a level of generalization and flexible enough that they wouldn't have to issue one every year. So whether or not this particular solution is viewed by the administration as something to go into this year's strategy under the assumption that this strategy will will be the strategy for three or four years, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe they decide it's too specific. But boy, as I said, it certainly is consistent with what the government is saying is going to be a major theme of the strategy. Really interesting. Let me just end by asking you if there's anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners. Yeah, I would encourage people who are interested in this subject to, of course, not only read our papers, but also go look at the Cyber Solarium Commission reports. It really was a a very effective commission. And I I say that having spent three years of my life, I'll never get back dealing with the 9-11 Commission. And, And their proposals are very common sense, and they're very actionable. And in fact, a number of them got enacted into law in one of the Defense Appropriations Acts a couple of years ago, including the creation of the National Cyber Director and the Cyber uh, Infrastructure Security Agency. And so part of the reason we wrote this paper is to incentivize businesses to do a lot of this stuff on their own, maybe with the eye that they could ward off regulation, but certainly with the eye that, you know, wearing another hat, I do cyber counseling for companies that it's better to get ahead of regulation than to be behind regulation. So that's thing one. Thing two is, and this is you know completely unrelated, but for 
folks who have interest in history, I do a podcast uh, called The Hidden History Happy Hour, which you can find at uh, hiddenhistoryhappyhour.com, in which we take little known true incidents from history and we talk about them, we tie them to issues of today, like the Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, and then we have cocktails while we do it. And we drink uh, what we think the subjects of our stories would be drinking. So, so if anyone has an interest in that, wants something a little bit lighter and less, less academic than um, what we talked about today, check it out. Hidden History Happy Hour. And I will say it is an, it's a very enjoyable podcast. And Brian, thank you so much for joining me. There aren't a whole lot of people that I know that could make the cyber insurance ecosystem an interesting topic to talk about. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. It's uh, it's nice that you know government's actually doing something, and um, who knows where it's going to go. But I think at a minimum, the debate is out there, and the issues are in the in the public discussion. And I think that's a good thing. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfareblog.com. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell and your audio engineer this episode was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.